The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. Deer season, just around the corner, November 15th. Time to get your gun out, make sure it's sighted in, make sure it's cleaned. Sighting it in, you're gonna to wanna to use a pair of these, something to protect your ears. I'll explain about that in a few minutes. We'll talk about hunting from a blind, some things you should carry with you, deer behavior, a lot more. So stay tuned, I'm Fred Trost, it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. The night before opening day, anticipation, excitement. A lot of talk about the weather. How will it affect the deer? Will this be the year you get the big trophy? Well, your odds will improve dramatically if you can stay in the woods all day. The first hour after sunrise is important, sure. But the opening day of firearm season is different than any other day of the year because of the number of people in the woods. From dawn until dark, they're filtering in and out, and that keeps the deer moving all day. Your strategy, if you want to see the most deer and have the best chance at a buck, is to sit still the whole day. Let the other hunters and all the deer do the moving. You stay put. If you're moving and walking, how do you expect to see a deer? With every step you take, the woods changes. Every tree looks different. Your eyes are overwhelmed. How can you spot a deer when you're moving? They'll spot you first and be gone. You'll have to spend part of the time looking down at your feet. And even if you're very careful where you step, you'll still make a lot of noise as you walk, crunching the leaves and twigs. The ears on a deer have 24 inches of reflective surface, while our ears have only three and a half inches. And deer can swivel their ears. So don't think a deer can't hear you walking. I suggest walking into your blind before daylight, wearing lightweight clothing. Now this is important because you don't want to work up a sweat before you even get started hunting. If you start to sweat, take off your jacket or your hat. Wet clothing will do more to make you cold than anything else. Now the socks inside your boots. Prepare to change them once you get in the blind. I'm serious. Your feet will perspire as you walk, and you'll wonder why your feet are cold two hours later. Carry all this gear in a day pack or a tote bag or a plastic bucket. Once you get in your blind, unpack and change. When it's cold, I carry in a snowmobile suit to change into. Now you're watching Ron Bacon right here from Okemos, a fellow who taught me an awful lot about hunting from a blind and staying comfortable in the woods all day. He's the one who sold me on carrying a day pack. Not for survival, but for comfort. Things you might need as the conditions change. Now his favorite hat is a red floppy brimmed felt hat. It's warm and the wide brim keeps the rain and snow off his face and his neck. Short build caps only keep the drizzle off your face. In a blind, you want to keep looking around all the time. If you've built the blind all around you, it's no problem to move your hands, get things out of your day pack, and still keep your eyes on the woods. Keep scanning. When you're hungry, and you will get hungry, eat high energy foods. Some of the kids' Halloween candy. It'll help keep you warm. But all the time, keep scanning the woods, the edges. Deer usually take a few steps and stop. If you're not watching, it's easy to let them slip by. That's why you want to stay still and let the deer move. You have a far better chance of spotting them when they don't see you. Your blind should be made from natural materials that blend in with the landscape. Pieces of wood you find on the ground, blown down trees and limbs, thatch it with some ferns. Go ahead, make a full-fledged fort. If your blind doesn't have gaps in it and your body is blocked from the deer, they can't see through your blind, then you have a lot of flexibility to move around without being seen. Only your head shows and you can keep head movements to a minimum. You don't have to hold your gun in a blind either. That's a big advantage. Set it in a way that uh, you can get to it easily but where you don't have to hold it. And of course, a blind like this has plenty of rests. Here's one of the biggest tips for success. The day before the opener, cut some visibility lanes, shooting lanes, right, like this right here. Wait for a deer to step into one of these lanes before you shoot. A clear shot makes a world of difference in putting venison on the buck pole. Now, most of the leaves will be off the trees on opening day and on the ground, but you don't want them around your feet. Take a minute or two to clear them away in your blind or wherever you set your stool or decide to stand. With the leaves and twigs cleared away, you can move around without making any noise. And chances are, when that buck shows up, you'll have to move. Most of the time, they're coming from a direction you didn't really expect. During the day, they're liable to be walking in the highlands, over ridges, especially around oak trees as they look for acorns. 
Well, the does will be looking for acorns mainly, and the bucks will be looking for the does. And deer will travel the high country to avoid the commotion of other hunters who will be moving around because they can't sit still. Now, if your blind has a view of some lowlands or the edge of a cedar swamp, so much the better. Watch the lowlands carefully because deer love to slip through the thick stuff and they do it quietly. They take a few steps and stop. Sometimes all you'll see is their feet. But keep watching. That's what you have to do if you want to see the deer. Constant, slow scanning. There's no other way. What about that gun? Well, it just sits there in your blind by itself. Don't touch it. That steel is cold. I mean cold. If you pick it up, you're not going to gain anything. It's just going to sap heat from your body. You want warm hands. If you keep your fingers off of that gun, you might stay comfortable without wearing gloves or mittens. Warm hands and warm feet, <laughs> precious items on opening day. I keep talking about comfort. Carrying in a day pack full of comfort items, food, extra clothing, rain gear, things to keep you warm and dry. That's so you can stay alert and have the best chance of seeing a deer on opening day. You might get so comfortable that you get sleepy. Well, great! There's nothing better than a nap in the woods. At least you're out there. The uncomfortable hunters are the ones who go back to camp. And by and large, they're not the ones who are going to get the deer. As you're watching the woods with those sleepy eyes, reach in your day pack, take out your thermos, and pour a cup of coffee or hot chocolate or hot cider. It'll warm you up, keep you awake, and you can continue to hunt from your blind and enjoy being in the woods. By early afternoon, you might have to conk out for a little while, but if you made your blind with this possibility in mind, you can stretch out and be comfortable. A lot of bucks are taken at this time of day, so don't sleep too long, though. My suggestion for opening day success is to hunt from a blind, carry in extra clothes and supplies so you can stay dry and warm and comfortable, and keep watching for deer. Let them do the moving, you stay put. Of course, if you get up and walk around, you'll be increasing my chances of seeing the deer that you move. But be safe with your gun and enjoy yourself. Opening day only comes once a year in Michigan Outdoors. Might as well spend your time getting ready for deer season. That's what everybody else is doing. According to Real Hunt, Hunting Outlet down in Trenton, everybody's put their boats away. They are waiting for gun season. BJ Sporting Goods uh, over at St. Joe says, hot spot is Berrien Springs Dam, limits of steelhead. Coho Bob says, limits of steelhead at Pentwater Lake, along with some 12 to 15 inch Menominee off the North and South Pier. Captain Emil Dean says, limits of steelhead at Manistee Lake and the river, seeing more bucks than ever. Now, Chief Sport Shop, Houghton Lake says, the lake is empty with fishermen. Flight ducks are coming in at night, leaving before daybreak. Squirrel hunters are doing well, though. Harlow's on the bay at Essexville says, fishing is slow, but they're taking bucketfuls of Menominee up at Skoda, according to Wellman Sports Center, no flight ducks have come through. Ace Hardware at Charlevoix says they're getting a couple steelhead per angler. Adrian's at Rogers City says deer in full rut, hunting fever is high, best bow season in years, according to Harry Reinfelder at Manuskong Bay. Few flight ducks, some big 12-inch perch being caught. Limits of a 9 to 11-inch perch and 5 to 7-pound walleye, according to Bayshore Resort in the Bay de Knox. Root Cellar, Lake Gogebic area says limits of grouse. Hunters are waiting for gun season. They rut, have the rut in full swing in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Limits of lake trout, browns, coho, according to Dick Blau up there and a couple partridge every time you go out. Let's take a moment now and listen to some great stories, family stories, in our trophy book. Mike Hilliard from Monroe had never taken a buck in over 10 years of bow hunting, but two weeks ago, he got this nice six point at 7.45 a.m. He was hunting in Lapeer County on his sister's farm. Now, Mike's brother, John, figured that Mike had the best blind, and he wanted to use it for the rest of the day. So Mike took in the six point to get it weighed. He decided to buy another license. So when Mike got back to the farm, John was in his blind. So Mike decided he'd send in John's blind for the evening. <laughs> you should have stayed there, John. Brother Mike took this seven point, his second buck of the day, his second in 10 years. Congratulations, Mike. You have the touch now. Meet Daryl Ansel, a police sergeant in Luna Pier, a bow hunter who took a bear earlier this year with his bow. That's his fifth bear with a bow. And Daryl's 13-year-old son, Derek, also took a bear this season with his bow. That Bruin was a 250-pounder. Now, Derek may be the only 13-year-old who has taken a bear with a bow in Michigan. And that's not all. 
This spring, he came through with another 13-year-old spectacular accomplishment. He barely missed a gobbler with a bow, and the last day he switched to his 20-gauge and took a tom with a 7-inch beard. His dad, Daryl, also got a gobbler with a bow, so both got turkeys and both got bears in 1987, and now they're bow hunting for deer to see if they can't get the big three. Wouldn't it be something to see them both on big buck night? It always gets your heart pumping to work days or even years and finally bag a trophy. Todd Baller from Linwood could hardly believe it. Todd got this on opening day, Mackinac County, 11-pointer. How big was it? Uh, 198 pounds dressed out. I, um, I was sitting up in, a, in my blind down there, and um, the first thing I seen through the pines is I seen these little points here, and that's all I could see. And then I didn't... I picked a spot ahead of him to shoot, and I seen part of his shoulder, and I let it go. And then I walked up to the deer after it was down, and I made about 10, 15 trips around the deer going, oh my God, oh my God, that's all I could believe. I, oh, it just was so exciting. Well, I guess it was. A 19-inch spread, 11-point buck. Got it up in Mackinac County. Todd, congratulations. Something to be excited about. Besides receiving commendation at our Stroh's Hunting Awards banquet, it's such a good story and such a good photo that we're going to make Todd Ballard our Michigan Outdoors Big Buck Hunter of the Week. Leftover antlerless permits for seven areas are available on a first-come, first-served basis beginning next Monday, November 9th. Over 3,500 total permits are available at the Jackson District Office for areas 147, 150, and 151. Landowner limited permits only are available at the Plainwell District Office for areas 137 and 156. The Grand Rapids area has a small number of permits in both regular and landowner classes for area 236. At Stevenson in the Upper Peninsula, there are 63 regular and 228 landowner permits for area 215. And 2,000 permits are available for the special December 1st through the December 15th hunt in area 215. If you didn't receive a permit or you didn't apply for an antlerless permit, you are eligible for one of the leftovers. There's been some confusion over whether the DNR's rule, ruling outlawing bolts, screws, and nuts in tree stands applies to private land, too. Herb Burns, DNR law chief, wants to clear that up. While the law doesn't differentiate between public property and private property, I can assure you as a law enforcement division, we're not concerned about what the local landowner does. If he elects to go out and nail a, a tree stand to, to his tree, we could care less. So you're not gonna you're not gonna run and ticket a guy for sticking a tree stand nail in a tree stand on his own property. No, the only way that I could see we might become involved in private property would be on complaint of a landowner that says that somebody's back there and they're nailing tree stands up, and we might give them some assistance in finding out who it is, and at that, at that point maybe issue a ticket. You could you could legally issue a ticket at that. That's point. right. But you're not concerned about the guy on his own property. Not at all. Ducks Unlimited has come home just in time for their 50th anniversary. DU used to spend the money they raised exclusively in Canada in the prairie pothole country where much of North America's duck nesting takes place. But now, through a matching aid program, hundreds of thousands of dollars are available for programs right here in Michigan. Like the Tuttle Marsh Project, dedicated two weeks ago near East Tawas. That project wasn't cheap. It cost almost $50,000 to construct three and a half miles of ditches and over 200 nesting sites. DU's program provided $25,000. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Other projects are set to go next year in the name of Marsh in the UP and Point Moulier in Monroe County. Experts say the pot for Michigan programs should reach $150,000 a year soon. With DU's new emphasis on Michigan, a contribution is even a better investment. Happy 50th birthday, Ducks Unlimited, and thank you. Let's take a minute to talk about an aspect of deer behavior that has more myths associated with it than any other aspect of deer hunting, the deer's nose. It's very powerful. Deer can smell things infinitely better than we can, but what really alarms deer? Deer aren't alarmed by the smell of gasoline, soap, gun oil, deodorant, potato chips, or coffee. These things might be strange or out of place smells to a deer that arouse their curiosity, but these smells don't alarm deer. So why do they run when they're downwind from you? Deer are alarmed by the smell of L-serine, an amino acid produced by the bodies of meat-eating animals. 
That's the smell that causes them to snort, throw up their tails, and head for the next county. Now think about it. Deer don't run when they smell a squirrel or a rabbit or a cow or a horse. They don't run when they smell a car whizzing down the road or a truck that's burning oil. These odors don't alarm deer. They're not threatening. What is threatening is the smell of a coyote or a dog or a wolf or a bear or a human. Meat eaters. And deer can smell that because we all produce specific amino acids because we eat meat. That's what alarms the deer. Now, they don't know a hunter from a ballet dancer by the smell. We all smell the same. So no matter what you put on your body, it doesn't matter. These products that are supposed to remove human scent, they don't remove the l -serine. They're not regulated by the FDA. They're not tested by underwriters' laboratories. They can't make you invisible. So here's my advice. Keep the wind in your face. Position your blind so your scent doesn't blow towards the deer. That's the way the Indians did it, and it's the only surefire way to keep a deer from being alarmed by your scent. Play the wind, you'll be a much more effective hunter. When it comes to disguising your scent, you can't beat Mother Nature. That's a basic fact in the world of hunting. The culmination of deer season, hopefully for most of us, will be bagging a deer for the venison to share with the family, share with friends. Share the venison? Share the venison. I don't know, that's good it. stuff. It certainly <laughs> is, but there's a question about the legality of this. From Fred Kelly of Clarkston, who says, I have five or six friends from work who hunt with a, within a five-mile area, all in different camps. If I should get lucky opening morning and fill my tag, is it legal for me to give some deer steaks to my friends to cook up for dinner? Is it legal them for them to have it? Two questions there. You said, is it legal for you to give it away? Of course it is. You can give venison to whoever you wish. You can't sell it, though. Now, is it legal to possess deer, venison, in a deer camp when everybody in the camp, where nobody has a tag that's, that's filled? They're all sitting there with, with licenses that have been <laughs> unused, and you're eating venison? Well, Herb Burns, the DNR Law Enforcement Division Director, uh, Chief, says that it is legal to do that, but you had better be able to prove where the venison came from, which means that, well, he says a conservation officer without a doubt is going to go to the other camp where you said it came from and try to find that deer from which the stakes were removed. They'll follow it up. Oh, sure they and will. And they should. And they should. And if you don't have a deer in camp, they're going to shake it down pretty good. They'll shake it down if you don't have an explanation that can be followed up. So that's the answer to that. Go ahead and, and give away your venison, but uh, the people who receive it, make sure you can explain exactly where it came from. Now let's see if you folks can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. In the wild, how much time will a buck spend with a doe that he's courting for breeding? A buck usually follows a doe for one day before she comes into heat, spends the following day mating with her, and then goes off to seek another doe. Snowmobiles, they're lots of fun and useful in the outdoors as well, but some of the older models were loud, up to 115 decibels. That's louder than the Occupational Health and Safety Administration allows for factories, because even 95 decibels over long periods of time can cause permanent hearing damage. 15 minutes on a loud snowmobile or unmuffled trail bike can cause slight hearing losses. For years, shooters never worried about ear protection until it was proven that the 130 decibels of a 22 rifle can affect your hearing. Shotguns with 140 decibels are often painful to hear, an indicator of potential damage, and high-powered rifles often crack out 160 to 170 decibels, the same as big bore handguns. When you consider that explosions above 120 decibels have been proven to cause permanent damage, very slight damage each time they hit your eardrums, but over the course of time, that damage stacks up. You can understand why ear protection is required at most competitive shoots. What about deer season? Now, sighting in, everybody does it or should, and too often, ear protection isn't worn, except by the people who shoot competitively and who understand what shooting can do to your hearing. You will lose your hearing as you get older, gradually. It's a fact of life. But shooting will cause greater losses faster if you don't protect your ears. Now, if your ears are sensitive, a long sighting in session can chip away at your hearing permanently. And another advantage of ear protection is you can shoot better. Without the loud noise causing a flinch and especially pain in your ears, you can hold the rifle steadier and you will, I guarantee, shoot better. But what should you put in your ears? The cotton types of plugs. No good, five to 10 decibel reduction at the most. If you get the rubber type you can reuse, again, if these don't fit right, it's not gonna do any good at all. The type you want is what's called cotton wool. 
Now these cotton wool soaked in wax, when you squeeze them, you squeeze them down to a little, little tube and put them in your ear, they will expand, and as they expand, they'll mold right to your ear. That's the best plugs you can get. But the best ear protection you can get are the ear muffs. They can cut out to 45 decibels, reduce it by that much. Great for target shooting and sighting in. But what about hunting? Hunting, normally you don't have to worry about running the risk of high ear damage because the woods soak up, <laughs> a lot of shooting here, a lot of the sound. So hunting isn't that critical if the shooters aren't near each other. But when you're on a shooting range, for fun or competitively, wear ear protection of some kind, preferably earmuffs. And keep in mind that other loud noises, chainsaws, snowmobiles, ATVs, take a toll over time. The moral? Protect your hearing now so you can enjoy all the sounds of the great outdoors forever. Dilly Venison Steak is the name of this recipe that Paul Rambat from Centerville sent to us. Little uh, tubes of venison, sort of like rouladen. Put a little gravy on them. Great appetizers. Not difficult to make either, are no, they? No, okay? there's not a lot of ingredients that goes into something like this either. You've got your steak. Now this has definitely got some fat that you want to trim off. Well, that's a that's a piece of loin. Yes. That has all of the fat on there. There it is, that's, all trimmed. That's how you want venison. Yes. Most of the time, for most. No purposes. matter what you're going to do with it. Right. You're going to trim these, and then you're going to slice some bacon. You're going to put it in thirds because the pieces of steak are quite small. They are going to become like appetizers. Just going to lay the bacon on top, and then going to go ahead and put some relish on. And like I said, there's not a lot of ingredients, not a lot of salt or pepper or anything in this. And that's about all there is to this. You're going to roll them up. Now, they are kind of difficult to roll without it being pounded, but I think that they are better this way. I think you Paul knew what he was doing, yes. Well, yeah, a lot of times the roulade recipes, or venison roll-ups as they're called, we've had a number of them, they're always good. They call for the steak to be pounded. But I it think just Bob... just makes it thinner. Yeah, Bob likes the bigger bites, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you roll that up just a pickle relish. Yep. Now you can put a toothpick through it or you can tie it with a piece of cord. And I opted to put two toothpicks through this. And you could put them in a pan and add just a little bit of water. Now there's no juice, no broth, no nothing else added to this. You're, you mean you're not browning it in? No. Nope. Oh, now that's different. Yep. Most of the roll-up roulade recipes call for browning it in browning hot oil. Browning first, right. So, well, without the oil and without the fat, you're talking oh, about a recipe here that is... Uh, very doesn't heart have the, smart. Yes. Heart smart, right. It doesn't have the cholesterol. Yep. That's going to cook Well, it does with, like the, with the bacon. Yes. It's just well, you could leave the bacon. bacon out. Just a little bit of bacon, huh, Bob? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I get got... first dibs on cleaning up the toothpicks, too. <laughs> Great stuff. You like that? Oh, I do. I do. Not highly seasoned. Uh, just... In fact, it's... In fact, it's not hardly seasoned at all. It's just good, good, flavorful stuff. I can't very really good. taste the pickle relish, can you? Or the bacon. I taste the venison, and that's it, and it's very, very good. But it is. It's a, it's a mild recipe. The gravy mm -hmm. you make from the just so it, drippings in the Just so because it is a little bit dry. That's mm. right. Or oh, you could use just, some canned stuff, couldn't you? Sure you could. Okay. Whatever. Bob wants some... <laughs> He wants some gravy. <laughs> the I'll quickest take those way two. there is. I'll take well, those last two right there. Folks, I hope you can get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Keep your fingers off of that gun, you might stay comfortable without wearing gloves or mittens. Warm hands and warm feet, <laughs> precious items on opening day. I keep talking about comfort, carrying in a day pack full of comfort items, food, extra clothing, rain gear, things to keep. With opening day of deer season right around the corner, we're gonna bring you an up to the minute forecast next week when the DNR Regional Wildlife Biologists visit our Michigan Outdoors cabin and give us details on the areas of the state with the most deer, the biggest deer, the biggest bucks, and the concentrations of hunters. It looks like a record-breaking year. Also, a number of you sportsmen will receive a letter from me this week on behalf of your local PBS station. It's a special mailing, pre-pledge mailing, asking you to contribute to PBS ahead of Big Buck Night. You'll get all the same benefits, membership in the Outdoors Club, including an opportunity to receive our PBS limited edition whitetail art print, which we'll reveal next week on Michigan Outdoors. So look for that letter in the mail, and if you can, make a pledge contribution now. Let's keep Michigan Outdoors strong. Have a good weekend, get your gun sighted in, and we'll see you right here next week. Stay dry and warm and comfortable, and keep watching for deer. Let them do the moving, you stay put. Of course, if you get up and walk around, you'll be increasing my chances of seeing the deer that you move. But be safe with your gun and enjoy yourself. Opening day only comes once a year in Michigan outdoors. Fred Trost Outdoor.